All right. Good morning, everybody. Bow with me, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for a couple of days away from this place. <laughs> thank you for the blessings. Keep your hand on us. Guide us. Let us do things that please you. Let us do things that don't harm. Lead God and direct us. Keep your hand on us and heed us. Let us do better. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Committee chairs get in the front. Mr. Wilkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I'm asking for House Bill 338, which changes the composition of the board of the Georgia Council for the Arts. The bill is requested by the governor and the Commissioner of Economic Development. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm asking for House Bill 283, again, which is part of the QBE Study Commission recommendations. This is taking the Title 20 law and asking us to modify, update, or eliminate about 30 areas that are identified in, in the Title 20 law. Is this one with all the language in it? <laughs> yes, sir. It's full of a lot of language. <laughs> Very colorful language. <laughs> yes, sir. Any questions for Mr. Coleman? No questions. Thank you, sir. Mr. Nix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to ask for two bills. These are two that I had asked for on Friday. The first one is House Bill 244, number six down on the back. This is the uh, uh, annual performance evaluations, changing uh, the evaluations for our teachers and principals. Questions? Y'all, we've got a serious situation up here at the front. Did, did they beat us? Okay. Okay. You ain't, you ain't excused. <laughs> okay, Mr. Co uh, Mr. Nix, what's the other one? The other one is House Bill 226, the fourth one down on the back page. Uh, this addresses how we handle the scrap tires, both the, the transportation and storage of those. Uh, trying to keep them from getting in the, the piles in the first place. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hatchet, this is the Senate Rules Chairman's evil twin. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I bring, I'm bringing to you House Bill 287 under modified open rule on the front page. It's moving the division of archives and history from the Secretary of State to the Board of Regents. Other than that being a wonderful bill, is there any questions? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Coomer. Thank you, Chairman. I'm asking for House Bill 188, which is on the second page which is uh, basically a veterans workforce bill passed out of committee unanimously. Any questions? Thank you. Thank Number you. 10, Benton. Mr. Benton. I had a, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a question for Mr. Representative Coomer. Mr. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I've, I've gotten several emails concerning this legislation about uh, people that are in the trades that have a concern with uh, just giving a license or a, a journeyman's license to someone who may who may have had some work in a certain field such as plumbing or uh, air conditioning but uh, 
would it not be better if we're going to do something like this that we require them to take a test to make sure that they that they do this? Well, first of all, we're not waiving any particular requirement by this bill. The bill simply establishes a committee composed of the Secretary of State's office, the Governor's Office of Workforce Development, and five members of the relevant governing board uh, that governs licensure for these five specific areas that are addressed in the bill. And the, the committee will determine whether or not there is a relevant military specialty that should, based on training, experience, and testing in the military, uh, be exempt from some level of those certification requirements by the state of Georgia. Only if those military requirements meet or exceed Georgia's existing requirements. So uh, of the five trade groups that are affected, four of those five uh, have endorsed the bill. There's one trade group that, that has not endorsed the bill, um, but ultimately the bill does not, let me tell you what it doesn't do. It doesn't say anybody who shoots an M16 gets to come in and be a plumber. I mean, that's not what we're doing here. Uh, it's it's going to be very specific uh, requirements that have to be met, and that those requirements will be set up by this committee. And, there may, and the committee may say there are no specialty codes that should receive exemption, and if that's the case, uh, there won't be an exemption uh, according to whatever that committee decides. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stetzler. Chairman, uh, how has this bill changed since it was originally introduced? I've had a hard time kind of tracking this through the process. The, the most significant change from the original bill is uh, with regard to that committee that was established. Originally, the bill required that the Secretary of State's division director would make a determination in consultation with the Governor's Office of Workforce Development and the five members of the relevant board. Instead, the current version says that there will be a committee that will decide together by majority vote, and that committee will be made up of those, uh, those same parties that I've just named. So, so, so we're not, and again, I just want to make sure, we, we, we've had some conversations. I, um, in prior life, commanded a military truck company and had some concerns that all my soldiers be released on the commercial marketplace driving long-haul trucks. Um, but this, if there's a process in place that can review that and maintain it, and that they have an ongoing responsibility to, to continue to review that process as it moves forward? That's right. And the committee, the, the members of the committee will be made up of state board members who are the functional area experts in the field being studied. So, for example, if we're looking at, at HVAC exemptions, the members of the committee will be from the HVAC portion of the, of the uh, license and contract licensing board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hardin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I bring this morning uh, House Bill 320. House Bill 320 is a bill that will uh, grandfather in basically those inert landfills which are currently in compliance with all the rules and regulations of EPD and EPA. It also corrects the situation that we found in our, our uh, work on this that currently if an agricultural person buries a stump on their property, they need a permit or in violation of, of the current inert uh, landfill laws. So we have made a provision to allow agricultural producers to operate in the manner they're accustomed without uh, violating the law. Thank you. If there are no questions, Mr. Chairman, I ask for your favorable approval. Mr. Spencer, let Mr. Spencer come up here before we just start throwing folks in front of you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I come back. I have a second request for House Bill 99. That is uh, legalization of allowing homebrew competitions in the state of Georgia. And we changed the uh, part of the code that would allow for proper transport and essentially mimics the Merlot to go law. And uh, that's essentially what the bill does. Did you say Merlot to go? Yes, sir. Huh? Merlot to go. Okay. <laughs> Does anything to do with Mad Dog 2020 or yeah. something? Like <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If, if you had got here earlier, you could have come, come on up, but just since you're last, come on. 
But I am tired. Better late than never, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, again, I just want to come before the committee. Uh, presented House Bill 155 last week, and uh, again, ask for the committee's uh, favorable consideration. Uh, 155 dealing with shooting reserve license and the uh, boater birthday. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I previously had asked for HB 123, the Parent and Teacher Empowerment Act, HB 141, which provides a, a notice to the victims of human trafficking that assistance is available, and HB 199, uh, which gives uh, GIFA greater flexibility in dealing with local governments uh, in terms of helping to uh, fund uh, either reservoirs or uh, water grids established in local areas. Uh, if there are any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer, but we've already asked for those previously. Today, in addition to those bills, I'd like to ask for HB 361 and HB 362. They're under modified structure. HB 361 codifies federal law uh, into Georgia law regarding uh, Georgia's status as a right to work state. It also clarifies that unions must maintain their relevance to their members by requiring they obtain from their members an affirmative decision to re-up each year. HB 362 bars uh, any, temp any attempt to circumvent our existing uh, right to work laws uh, by barring uh, state or local governments and public work projects from requiring that union labor be included in any type of uh, bid for a public project. Mr. Roberts. Senator Lindsay, I'll go back to House Bill 141. Yes, sir. Uh, if you would, please. Um, before we start on line 33 down through 44, and we're starting to talk about farm labor contracting or transport and all, and I, I think I understand where you're trying to go with that. I, I guess my question is, how are we going to post signs and, and all um, in, in these areas when a lot of times they're just picked up and uh, brought out in the field and as far as facilities, there's no real one main place that they're meeting at or anything, I mean. The bill obviously won't be able to capture every possible instance. We're talking about places of business. Um, so it's, it's, it's obviously, if it's simply a matter of being picked up in a pickup truck and taken out to a work site and back, you're probably not gonna be able to capture them by this bill. But yeah. it, but I guess as far as posting requirements or anything, at where would they post any kind of requirements or anything? Well, like I said, I don't believe that we're going to be able to capture that kind of situation by this bill. But if they do maintain type of some type of central location where they where they meet with the workers, then then that's where the, it would be posted. I guess the the only concern I've got, representing that, I'll, I'll I'll leave it. And we can move on. Is I'm, I'm scared that what we're doing is we're telling them they're, by law that they have to do it, but yet there's no way for them to do it. Well, I, I, I believe, yeah, I believe from, if you, from the reading of the bill itself, it's clear that if they don't have any kind of office that won't pertain to them, this will come to the floor as, as modified open. If you can figure out, uh, I think the law is pretty clear that it won't pertain to them, but if you, if you want to simply sort of tighten that regarding a place of business, where, where they operate. I'll be happy to work with you on, a, on an amendment on the floor. This, I do intend for this to come out modified open. And I think you're trying to get it to coyotes and all that. Yes, sir. I think that's where you're trying to go with it. I just want to make yes, sir. sure we can. And, 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 and I agree with you. Uh, like I said, I, 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 we, we tried to answer to that, but if you feel like some additional tightening needs to be done, I'll view that as a friendly amendment on the floor. Sure. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions on one of these? All right. The minority leader, Ms. Abrams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lindsay, I have a few questions about 361 and 362. Yes, ma'am. Uh, on 361, lines 90 through 92 and 110 through 109 through 110 require. Uh, if you hold on just a minute, I'm sure. sorry. Three sixty one. Which but which line? Lines uh, ninety one through ninety two, or sorry, ninety through ninety two, and one hundred nine through one ten. These are the two uh, sections that deal yes. with annual reauthorization. Yes. Can you speak to the necessity of requiring annual reauthorization? What what precipitated 
the need to introduce this legislation? Well, like I said, we are a right to work state and uh, simply just making sure that, that the workers understand that they have an opt in or opt out when it comes to union uh, participation, I think is very important public policy. Um, does this not require, instead of allowing for opt-in and opt-out, which currently exist under our law, the way I read this, it actually requires an annual reauthorization, which means you have to go through the entire process, which puts an onus on both the employer and the employee and the unions to go through a fairly lengthy process to reinstitute authorization every year. Uh, can you tell me why we need this? Has there been some local issue that's necessitated changing what has been almost 30 years of our history of not requiring this type of change. As I stated before, I believe it's important for the workers to understand their rights, and that's what this bill essentially does. Can that be accomplished through notification versus through changing the process through which authorization happens? I think I think that a notification is a, is a stronger way of doing it in terms um, of reinforcing our right to work status. Uh, and then, if I can also direct your attention to 95 through 98, uh, you specifically carve out educators, law enforcement officers, and firefighters. Is there a reason that they are given special treatment that we don't accord to every worker in the state of Georgia? No, they're, 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 as, as stated in the bill, they are up, they're carved out because uh, they're not involved in collective bargaining. We similarly also, I might point out, also carve out uh, uh, transit workers because there's already a pre preemption underneath federal law. Uh, and one final question on 362. Uh, the, the genesis of this bill, uh, we had a similar bill introduced last year, and the concern raised both last year and this year is that this interferes with the ability of a local government to require that there be uh, local participation in contracts. For example, there's this potential stadium thing that's happening in a city near us. Uh, would this interfere with the ability of the city of Atlanta, for example, to require that it, as an, in exchange for contributing billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars, that there be certain requirements that uh, folks from Atlanta be hired through community benefit or community work agreements? I think what this bill specifically calls for is that is the fact that you cannot mandate uh, through the back door, which you can't, which, which, which we don't permit through the front door in terms of our right to work status. We don't believe either, uh, since we've established that state public policy, we don't wish for either state or local governments to circumvent that. So can you specifically respond to the question of whether this would interfere if the city of Atlanta sought to require as a condition of contribution of hundreds of millions of dollars to the stadium deal that uh, certain that community benefit agreements and community work agreements be implemented to guarantee that local members be hired if, for these jobs? Would this the, interfere with that? If you're speaking of community work agreements, if you're speaking of labor unions, <laughs> yes, it would do that because we're not going, we are a right to work state. If the labor union, if, if a contractor wishes to use labor, union labor, and there may very well be good reason for them to do so, uh, because oftentimes they can provide a certain amount of expertise, that's perfectly fine. But we're not going to mandate that a private entity just to be able to offer a bid uh, uh, have union labor. Thank you, sir. Mr. Peake. Mr. Chairman. I'd like to request uh, HB 266, which is the annual Internal Revenue <laughs> Code, uh, the Georgia Tax Code, tax repairs all over the state, waiting for us to move this important piece of legislation. Mr. Golick. Green. Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is, um, I'd like to respectfully request House Bill 91, uh, Chairman Benton's bill, and it was worked on in committee, and, and we added some things that protect some of these monuments along the side of the roads from being taken down and or lost, and which has become a real problem in the state of the state of Georgia. Mr. 
Ms. Protam. Mr. Cassis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask for uh, HB 184 is the first one on the back. Um, 184, it is a, uh, a bill that allows uh, non-public colleges and seminaries in the state to operate by means of accreditation. This is a repeat of a bill that we had last year. We just ran out of time. Ms. Cooper. Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, asking for House Bill 318 and House Bill 338 again. That was 338 and 318. Ms. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask for House Bill 320, earlier asked for today by Representative Hardin. Thank you. Well, since he's here, we'll let Mr. Hamilton ask for something. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was sorry for the tardiness. I was doing the people's work in another committee, but I managed to get out of there to get back to this important committee. Uh, ask for uh, House Bill 393. It deals with uh, setting up some new processes and procedures uh, based on the Workforce Investment Act. We receive annually about in excess of $70 million in federal funds to be distributed through the uh, Workforce Development Board. And unfortunately, we don't have code on the proper procedures and processes, and we face a great liability if we don't do some things. And so this simply sets that up. What was that number again, Mark? 393. On the second page, right before structure. Okay. Mr. Rice. You sure can. And your button's pushed, too, so. Uh, Mr. Hamilton? Yes, ma'am. On uh, HB 393, uh, the Workforce Investment Board Act, one of the provisions you have indicates that if the performance standards are not met, the board can be reconstituted. Are you talking about all of the performance standards, one standard? Because as you know, the Workforce Development, uh, Workforce Investment Boards have a number of performance standards that they have to meet each year, and they're classified as meeting or exceeding or did not meet. So if you're saying they, meet, they don't meet one standard, we they can be reconstituted at that point? I'm saying that there's a process if we felt like that uh, they're not meeting the obligations and requirements of their position, then this simply addresses that opportunity. Right now, there is no measure to hold that local workforce investment board accountable. I guess I'm a little bit interested in this because I've been on a workforce investment board for several years, and uh, boards across the state have not traditionally had problems. Uh, so what is precipitating us doing this and, and giving the state, and I've been on the state workforce board before, so what is precipitating us giving the state workforce board this kind of authority sure, over I've, the local boards at this juncture? Thank, thank you for the question. I think that uh, over the last year we have reviewed this very, very closely and the findings have, are coming in. And what we find is that in many areas it is being done correctly, that workforce investment boards are doing their job appropriately. But unfortunately, we have some other areas that uh, 
are not doing it the way that it should be, the intention of the funds from the federal government. And unfortunately, Georgia, as we have tried to step in and talk to those boards, they basically have told us at the governor's office that we have no authority, we have no responsibility, and they continue to do it the way that they want to. And so this has simply given us the opportunity when we identify those problem areas or those problem situations that we can step in and do that. A great example is this most recent uh, review of all of this is that only 6.4 of that $70 million that was distributed this last year, only 6.4% of all of those funds went to actually people that are on the unemployment rolls, 6.4%. Only 6.4% of the people on the unemployment rolls received money. The rest of it went either to administration or funding other programs. Now, some of those other programs might be going to aid in workforce development, but one of the stated purposes is for this to go towards people that are on the unemployment rolls. Well, um, Mr. Chairman, as you know that that's not the only sector that workforce investment boards work with. Workforce investment boards are charged to work with people that have barriers to employment. They're in charge to work with young people, dislocated workers. So that is not the only criteria, point number one. Secondly, uh, an example in Columbus was that this new entity came in and did audits on top of audits that are, had already been done and approved by the Department of Labor and the U.S. Department of Labor and came to Columbus and say, you know, you have a bill that the city did not owe. So there seems to be some confusion as to whether or not this new entity is operating in conformance with uh, the federal requirements. And I hesitate for us to go in and be so heavy handed with this new law at this time, particularly at the speed in which this legislation has has moving through our process and we're not actually vetting it uh, and talking about what we're doing here because uh, this new entity has been in operation for, for less than a year and um, if all the workforce investment boards are being treated the way ours were treated, then I have some serious concerns about this. Thank you. I'll just make one final comment. We have an example where a board in their board rules has a quorum of one. So they can call a board meeting and all it takes is one member to show up at that board and they can have a quorum and transact business. I think those are the types of examples that we have found in many of these boards. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be quiet. Mr. Lindsay. Just one last, last comment. Um, I understand some of the policy reservations that may be expressed on the board rather about the bill, but this bill has not raced through uh, without being vetted. It, it sat through a subcommittee in which I was on that subcommittee for an extended period of time. It sat through a full committee for an extended period of time and now in the rules committee. So while we may have some policy difference over it, I assure you that it has been vetted through, through the committee process rather than being raced through. What is it? Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd briefly uh, First is on the second page, B283. It's the education update to uh, Title 20, uh, and it sets, in, sets forth the provisions that will allow us to, uh, to do the flexibility bill. As Chairman uh, Coleman's bill was a bipartisan, unanimous vote. Next one is 293, next one down, which is the tuition equalization grant for private, private colleges. Asking for that, it will enhance the nursing opportunity. Uh, for training from nurses in this state, which we so sorely need. Mr. Chanel. Anybody else? Okay. All right. All right. This is the calendar for tomorrow. Under structured HB 266. Do I hear a motion? Any opposition? 
Was that opposition? All right, it's on under modified structure. No, let me go to open. Under modified open, HB 287. Any opposition? Under mo its own, under modified open, HB 320. Any opposition? Its own, under modified open, HB 338. Any opposition? That's it. 